Hi guys, welcome back to Hear Our Voices. This is your host, Kay Did. Guys, our voice is still not back to where it needs to be, so sorry for the little raspiness. Hopefully it doesn't bother you too much. So today we have on our show, Jimmy Marr. He's going to tell you more about himself, but before we get into that, I'm going to tell you, um, you can look down below. Most of these things will be in the description box down below, but if you don't look there before I tell you, this is the information. So we had a panel that came out last week. By the time you hear this, it'll be like a couple weeks have passed already. If you ha- wasn't live on the panel, the panel will be on our, as one of the episodes on here. So you can see that we have much more plan- panels coming up in the future. Hopefully you can join if you want to be a part of those panels. If you're, you know, a person who has experience in homelessness, you can definitely um, email us and DM-, DM us. I'm on social media literally 24 hours a day, so I'm always available. As I said before, I'm not the only person who does the social media. So if you want to talk to me directly, you can follow me and then DM me and tell me where you came from. If you're okay with talking to anybody, it doesn't matter. They're all helped. They're all here to help you have a better life and get information. And, you know, that's what we're doing. It's not just like just doing a podcast. We're here to help families out. And if you're just a person who is just homeless or about to be homeless, if you're not even a family person, we do have um, resources that can still help you. Um, most of the information we do give out, they cater to everybody. So don't feel like you're left out or anything like that. But thank you for listening to the podcast. Also follow us on Twitter. We have a new Facebook page because we made it public instead of private. And we have a YouTube channel. And we're also starting a TikTok. So guys, if you want to follow us on different social medias, platforms, and you want to be a part of our family here on HOV, Hear Our Voices, definitely follow us. And I forgot to say Instagram, I think. I'm not even sure. But follow us on different platforms. If you want to follow me, you can. On most platforms, I'm KD Davis. You can follow me over there. So Jimmy, because he's our yes. main contender for today. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you do for the homeless community and the families at large? Sure. Um, so my name is Jimmy Marr. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I'm policy director for Safe Horizon. Uh, Safe Horizon is the nation's largest victim services nonprofit organization. Um, We help about 250,000 New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence and abuse. Um, And that is across many different programs here in New York City in the five boroughs. Um, We operate domestic violence shelters. We operate the city's 24-hour domestic violence hotline um, and rape and sexual assault hotline and crime victim hotline, as well as our safe chat where survivors of any forms of violence can chat with an advocate uh, through our website. Uh, We have community programs, court programs, um, legal programs, including our immigration law project and domestic violence law project. Um, We have advocates in all of the police precincts. We're at all of the family justice centers. Um, We operate the city's five child advocacy centers, so one in each borough. Um, We have a runaway and homeless youth program called Street Work Project, uh, where we have drop-in centers um, and um, emergency shelter. Um, so, and I, I'm probably forgetting uh, some of our programs, um, but that that's um, what we do for victims and survivors here in New York City. Um, and in terms of uh, surveying homeless folks, I mean, of course, our Street Work Project is running, uh, working with runaway and homeless youth. Um, so that is um, uh, youth, young people who are unhoused, living on the street, um, seeking assistance. Um, and of course, many of the folks who have experienced violence and abuse are seeking housing. Um, we know that domestic violence is one of the main drivers of homelessness here in New York City. Um, so of course, um, we are a proud member of the Family Homelessness Coalition um, because I mean, we want to partner with other organizations, advocates, people with lived experience to make sure that all New Yorkers have access to um, safe, stable, affordable housing. That's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, a lot of, of information. Um, what I see with these um agencies, and they do a lot of different things, and I feel like, I guess a lot of them intersect anyway, so it mm-hmm. makes sense. But it's like a lot of things under one umbrella. It 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 might be overwhelming to remember what services you even have. To yeah. be honest, <laughs> it's understandable. Yeah. Um. Well, since we are family, we mostly do uh, family, but I'm gonna get into domestic violence. I feel like mm-hmm. domestic violence can be anybody. You don't have to just be a family person to be in domestic violence. Like, I mean, when I think when I think of family, I think of mom and dad and, and kids in the shelter. That's what I think of. I think of family. 
Yes, families are structured different ways. That's why I think of families, but anybody can be in domestic violence um, situations. You can be, I guess, go to shelter as a single person if you don't have any kids. So I want to ask questions about that. Um, sure. Can you... What, can you tell us the signs of some domestic violence um, things? The reason why I ask this question, because a lot of people are in domestic violence situations mm -hmm. and they're sad in their relationship or even at home. It could be like a, it, most of the time when they say domestic, it's like if you live with the person that's like um, abusing you, can you define what that is, what they consider domestic violence and what are the signs people should watch out for knowing that they're in that situation? That's, a, I think, the proper question to ask. Sure. Um, so, and for resources and information, including in, um, information about domestic violence, you can, of course, go to our website, uh, safehorizon.org. Um, that's safehorizon with no S at the end, dot org. Um, so when we're talking about domestic violence, we're really talking about power and control. Um, so where one person, this is um, framing that I learned from another organization, the Anti-Violence Project, AVP. Um, they, they, when they talk about domestic violence, they're talking about like one person's world is getting smaller while the other person's world is getting bigger. Um, so one person exerting power and control over the other through physical violence, emotional abuse, um, sexual abuse, um, maybe using the kids, um, using the pets, um, economic abuse is like, is um, I think an often unspoken piece of domestic violence. So maybe um, forcing the other person to take out credit cards or take on debt um, or just like taking taking money from that person. Um, so domestic violence can look a lot of different ways, but ultimately it is about power and control. Um, and when I say domestic violence, um, it, that to me, that's also an umbrella term because with domestic violence, we could be talking about family violence because of course family uh, violence can happen between um, siblings, between like a parent and ch child, um, other family members. Um, Domestic violence could also be intimate partner violence. So um, abuse that is happening um, between intimate partners. So somebody that you are in a current relationship with, there's somebody that you were in a former relationship with or dating violence. Um, a lot of times we don't, as a society talk about teen dating violence, that is also part of domestic violence. So domestic violence can happen between teenagers. Um, also, I mean, domestic violence or DV, sometimes we, we shorten it. Um, we love acronyms in, in this sector, in this little uh, nonprofit world. Um, DV is interconnected with other forms of violence and abuse. So of course, gun violence, elder abuse, child abuse, um, sexual violence. So and that, that's why domestic violence, it's, I mean, it's, it's so pervasive, much more pervasive than I think we, than we would like to acknowledge. Um, but that's why we just, that Safe Horizon, I mean, we, our organization is a little different from some of our sibling organizations in that we work with survivors of all forms of violence. So not just necessarily domestic violence. Um, our, some of, like many of our programs are working with people who have experienced harm and, and violence by, from strangers, um, by neighbors, by landlords. Um, but all of these forms of violence are interconnected because I mean, ultimately what we're talking about is trauma as well. We wanna make sure that survivors, uh, folks who have experienced violence and abuse are getting the, the help they need to be able to process and heal from their trauma. I'm happy that you said that because I think a lot of people don't even think about financial um, abuse. And I'm happy that yeah. you said um, you don't only deal, you know, we're, we're here for families, but anybody who needs help really that um, about elder abuse, people don't even think about, you know, when you get older, yes, like when you're a baby and when you're old, you're most vulnerable to a lot of things because when you're younger, when you're a baby, you can't even talk. So once yeah. you get older, kind of realize what's happening. And when you're older, people honestly sometimes forget that you're even existing because it's like, I'm not saying that you're not contributing, contributing, but you're not out in the forefront compared to a person in the middle of those ages, like in the yeah. middle who can do more and say more and people will listen to kind of more than a person who's like elderly. Um, So I'm very happy that you added that in there. I never like when he was talking. I was I don't think about a lot of those things because it's, it's not in the forefront. I do think of like partner abuse. I do think of that. And that's what I think probably in my brain to think of that. But there's so much other aspects that you can be into, and I'm happy that um they give those they give space for a lot of things. And not just like one thing. Oh, if a spouse spouse abuse or a boyfriend, you know, and with the teens also, you'd be surprised how much teens are in these situations. Yeah. And you think, oh, they're young, they're not going to, no, 
most of the time, little Jimmy or little Sarah is at home seeing their parents doing this, and they think it's okay. Because most times, it, people are just not hitting people, you know? Yeah. Most times, it's happening in their home. They saw, they learned this behavior, and because they saw the behavior, they're acting out on other people to have dominance. Sometimes, they don't even know why they're doing it. Oh, you, and sometimes, they, they're, oh, you made me upset. Oh, it's your fault. It's never usually them. They think, oh, it's my fault. I should know I control myself. But yeah. a lot of it, most times, are learned behavior. Yeah. And and I mean, yeah. Continue. Oh. <laughs> no, of course, you're exactly right. I mean, that's what we're talking about when we talk about like the cycle of violence. Of course, the cycle of violence can happen within one relationship. So I mean, there, there's kind of like a cycle where it's like the cool down period and then gift giving and then um, kind of um, the abuse might be starting to bubble up more and then explode. Um, so that there's that cycle. But then like, I also think of the cycle of violence as intergenerational that um, I mean, that is why we want to make sure that folks are getting the help that they need and that they deserve. Um, because like you said, I mean, this is a lot of times we're talking about learned behavior. Like I've worked with clients who, um, so in, um, I've been with the organization for over 13 years. I used to do direct service. And, um, a few years ago, I moved over to the policy side of things in our government affairs office. When I did direct service I mean, I had clients that would talk about like their kid being mean to like, um, starting to abuse them. Like when they were, um, still children, like still babies, like 12, 13 years old. And of course that makes sense because, to like that kid, maybe like that is what he learned that like we we show mom we love her by being by bullying her and belittling her. Um, of course, that that the violence has become normalized. So I mean, we want to interrupt that cycle and really um, try to um, again provide healing, help um, folks uh, heal from trauma, um, and also we I mean we want to interrupt those um, harmful behaviors um, that especially kids might be learning about. Um, so that we we can ultimately end domestic violence. I, it's maybe I, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I believe that it's possible to end domestic violence. Um, it just takes a ton. Uh, it'll require a lot of all of us, um, a joint effort, um, a lot of time, energy, resources. But I I believe that it's possible to end domestic violence. I think it's impossible to do anything. It's just we have to all come as a collective. Yep. And work as just not like only your organization, but all the organizations who intersect into that person. Because example, if it's um a person with domestic violence, but they might need a job, and they might they, they might be on all these other services, but all the services that sometimes don't work together. The mm -hmm. person could just be pushed in so much di different directions, but they'll pick the one was most you know you know pertinent to them at the time. But they really need help in other areas too, and they might not think they need yeah. as much because they think having a job is more important but you need a job to survive especially in yeah. the city but you do need to help your yourself heal from these yeah. things um and i think we're thinking about the person who's abusing but we have to think about also the person getting abused but also the person who's who got the abuse they need to also heal from what is going on and yeah. hopefully don't put that onto other people after they know it's wrong but it's like i can't help myself because now i have to make hurt they say hurt people hurt people and that's mm -hmm. what usually happens because it's usually a cycle of um, yeah. everything going on. And, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It hurt people, hurt people, but also healed people, heal people. Right. Um, that like that's the flip side. So of course, like I mean, um, it's almost like kind of like paying it forward. That like once we help people to heal, I mean, they can go on to, I mean, do great things um, and great things for other people. Um, yeah. That's definitely true. So you said in the beginning, we're trying to get more back into the family, but I just yeah. want to put that out there because it doesn't matter who's listening. You could be a person in that situation and don't even realize it's happening to you. That mm -hmm. person, as he said before, um, it's sometimes a cycle. And I learned that when I was very, very young, like um, I haven't personally been in it, but I'm like about the cycle, about it happening just a little bit. It stop the gift giving and it starts all over again. And there's more to it than that, but I'm just giving you like the, the shortcuts of it. Yeah. You might be in the part when the person's just plucking you, just hitting at you, shout it off to be even hitting. It could be them talking down to you, saying yeah. that you're too fat, you're too ugly. And most of the times these happen to I'm not I say mostly women, but men or just people in general try to break down your self esteem. You're ugly, you don't have this. And then most of the time, these are the prettiest people in the world because somebody else broke down their self esteem, they can't even believe what they see in the mirror. You know, so um, it might not just be physical. It can be by words. And people say sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But honestly, that's not true. People have done things to themselves because words of other people have hurt them. So 
that saying might be cute as a kid, but in real life, words can hurt you. Words do affect you. Words stay with you from your child to an adult. You're like, why do I act this way? Because something happened in my childhood that somebody said to me, and it affected me to adulthood. So yeah, I'm just yeah, we, here, guys. Yeah, and I've worked with so many survivors who they've been, um, I mean, they've experienced awful, awful abuse. And that that's not to compare um, any, like any violence is, is bad. Um, but like have experienced physical violence, but they are often really, they come in and the, the, the violence that they're really focused on is the emotional abuse. Um, just like that psychological torture. And like you said, like all of those comments to just be little people. Um, and also, I mean, I think that um, a lot of the folks that I've worked with as well, like they would also just talk about how um, the the thing that they, that really sticks with them also is that the people that care about them, like maybe their mom, their sisters, their, their, their friends often will say things like, well, you should have known better. You should have done that. Or you need to do this. You have to do this. Um, so, I mean, we also unintentionally hurt the people around us too, who might need help. Um, so, I mean, that's usually something that I try to plug as much as, as possible that if, if a loved one comes to you um, talking about how they might be experiencing domestic violence, just be caring and compassionate um, and really try, try not to use controlling power, like powerful language, like you should do this, you need to do this. Um, because survivors are the experts in their own safety, the experts in their own lives. Um, and we don't wanna pile on to them. We wanna help them and partner with them and connect them to the resources that, that they need. Okay, also, I wanna say that not all advice is good advice. When you were saying that, I'm like, yeah. people like to give you advice and sometimes yeah. in the same situation and they be like, you know what? But yet, you know how it feels to be that person and it happening to, why would you give somebody opposite advice when you know that's not gonna work for them? But yeah. you think, and you know it's not working for you. So not all advice is good <laughs> advice either. So yeah. you have to think, step back. It might be mommy telling me, oh yeah, he might give me a black eye and that's okay for a couple of, he don't, he don't do it often enough. Yeah. No, you have to take care of yourself and realize where it's coming from and what what in their life might be screwing them up to make them think that that being is okay. You know, so you have to think about where you're getting that advice from and what background they have to even tell you anything about anything, to be honest. Um, so as you said before, I'm trying to get back into the things you guys <laughs> offer. You said um, housing and what else? What else for the um, homeless, the families, exactly? I'm going to get into the family stuff. I feel like the domestic violence stuff covers like an umbrella of people. Mm -hmm. So I want to get in more into the, the family um, economics and how easy it is to get into your services. Like if I came in today, what would I need to qualify to even get help from you guys? Sure. Um, so, I mean, we don't have anything, like we don't have any requirements for you to, to qualify. Um, of course, you can call our 24-hour um, hotline. That's one 800 621-HOPE, um, 1-800-621-4673. Um, and that way you can connect with an advocate. A lot of um, folks call that hotline because they're looking for shelter. Um, so, I mean, we operate the, like I said at the beginning, we operate the city's 24-hour domestic violence shelter and other hotlines. Um, and um, with an advocate, I mean, what they're doing is really providing, um, doing an assessment, but then providing some emotional support, some safety planning. And if folks are looking for emergency domestic violence shelter, we can um, check the database to see if there's any availability. Um, and if there is, then we will connect that person to um, that shelter for, the, for an intake for their own assessment. Um, and hopefully um, that survivor will be connected to that shelter. Um, domestic violence, so that's that's one service and we do operate um, uh, some domestic violence shelters here in New York City. Um, so that I think is one of like the key housing pieces. And when somebody's in domestic violence shelter, we are connect, um, our housing specialists will, will go through all of the housing options. Um, I mean, as you know, Kay did, um, and like the work that we do with the Family Homelessness Coalition is that there just aren't enough housing resources out there. Um, so, I mean, we're always trying to advocate for, for more and better housing resources, um, but our housing specialists do review like all of the different available um, housing options, um, whether they're like city vouchers, state vouchers, um, maybe New York City Housing Authority, um, that's public housing, NYCHA, um, those types of um, resources. Um, our Runaway and Homeless Youth Program Streetwork Project does the same. So, I mean, we have um, some shelter beds um, for runaway homeless youth. Um, but of course, our, our staff are also working with young people to review what their housing options are. 
whether that's supportive housing applications um, or now um, runaway and homeless youth do um, there can qualify for certain uh, certain vouchers. Um, they've been doing a ton of work on the EHV vouchers, the emergency housing vouchers, um, which um, is like basically Section Eight. Um, so I mean, we 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 of course are connecting folks to emergency temporary shelter, but then trying to connect them to more long term housing solutions. Um, and sometimes the housing solutions might be like, how do we get you in an economic like um, in a good financial place so that you're able to afford um, your own apartment. So some of these solutions take more, may, may take longer, um, but of course we're just trying to connect folks to whatever resources may be available and that they might qualify for it. So you don't have to qualify for our services, um, but you may, there are certain qualifications to be able to qualify for some of the different um, housing resources out there um, through our government. So I have a question. So yeah. when they call into the phone, like ring, ring, the person mm -hmm. who contacts them first, you said is the advocate, is it a person with lived experience or just a person that's like a title of their, what they do is just called advocate? So like at our hotline, you mean? Yes. So our hotline staff. Um, so, I mean, I can't speak uh, for any of my colleagues in, colleagues in particular, but I mean, many people that come into this work um, are survivors or have experienced um, violence in their past or maybe grew up in an abusive household. Not everybody, like, for example, like I'm not, like I don't identify as a survivor um, and I, I don't have experience with domestic violence in my home growing up. Um, but there are many colleagues of mine who um, I who have lived experience. Um, some of them are disclosed that, others might not. Um, so that's something that I try to keep in mind whenever, especially when I'm in like coalition spaces that there are some folks at the table identifying as a survivor and like might be there as a survivor or somebody with lived experience, um, but then there are others um, who might might not be at the table specifically as a survivor, but they might have lived experience. Um, and some of our programs, I think, intentionally hire folks um, with lived experience. That is something our street work project is is very proud of, um, hiring former former clients who uh, were uh, who were runaway and homeless youth that we that we served. Um, but our, our with our hotlines, um, I mean. A survivor can just call the hotline and and connect with that advocate. And then the advocate is so at Safe Horizon, we try to do everything in um, a client centered way. Um, so we use client centered practice as kind of like our um, as our framing when we're when we're talking with folks, um, which means that we are using their language. Um, we are um, just trying to be a compassionate um, ear and um, really focusing on what that person is identifying as, as their risks and what are they're identifying as their needs so that we can connect them to the appropriate resources. We don't wanna just throw a ton of, like the way that I'm throwing a ton of information at you, our advocates don't wanna overwhelm folks by just like, this is everything. These are all of the, because there's just so, like, like we said, there's just so much to know and understand. Mm -hmm. We wanna really focus on what that survivor is calling about. So, and some say I, I'm calling because I want shelter. Um, so then that will start the, the intake process um, to, to be to find shelter placement. And if there isn't available placement in like a domestic violence shelter, like tonight, let's say, um, there are still other housing, um, other shelter resources, specifically through like the Department of Homeless Services. Um, so here in New York City, the domestic violence shelter system is overseen by HRA, the Human Resources Administration. Um, and the homeless, um, which is for single adults, um, and also the uh, the family homeless families um, are connect um, might seek shelter through um, DHS, the Department of Homeless Services. So when they again, I'm trying to go through the process you said, so I can, mm -hmm. people can understand because sure. honestly, most of the stuff he's saying, I don't know how it works. I've never <laughs> been through the situation, so I'm thinking of a person who might be listening who who doesn't know anyway and yeah. want to see what the information is. So. I'm calling the phone, I get to a person, I'm having problems tonight. And you, mm -hmm. the next step is that they call to see who has um, bedding. Mm -hmm. So is it like how, because I know when I went to PATH, they mm -hmm. have the NOVA program and yep. they have regular people who are just, who just need housing. So is it that Safe Horizon goes to the NOVA or that's a completely different entity altogether? In my mind, that's, it's a different entity, but yeah. I could be wrong. It's a completely different entity. Okay. Um, so like a, like a domestic violence survivor will call our 24 hour hotline, speak with the advocate, 
Um, the advocate will, of course, like do some safety planning with the with the person, go over some resources, and if the the caller is um, identifying that they do want shelter placement tonight, because like um, if you do want to go into DV shelter, you like if there is availability, you're likely going to have to go, like pick up and go. So it's really like, are you? Um, so sometimes when callers call and we we walk through the process, they say, you know what, I'm not ready for that right now, um, and we'll safety plan, of course. Um, maybe make a plan for the next 24 to 48 hours um, and let them know like, okay, whenever you're ready, you can call back. Um, so if, let, so let's say they say, yep, I want to go into DV shelter. Our hotline advocate will do an intake. Um, so it's questions that the, that the system requires to know a little bit more about um, this person and their situation. Um, and then once that intake is done, um, we'll see if there's any availability. So we're able to, it's not just our safe rise in DV shelters. We're able to see what's what's available um, across the city in, from other DV shelter providers as well. Um, of course, it should be, um, it would need to be like in a safe borough or a zip code. Um, so like we don't want to place DV survivors like right down the road if that's not safe for them. So um, if there is availability, we'll connect them directly to that other shelter for their own um, particular like um, organization specific intake. Um, and then they'll take it from there. Um, that sounds like a lot, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but I know it has to be done to get the best possible outcome. Yeah. You were saying um, that they, obviously, well, I wouldn't think they would do that, put them in the same neighborhood they were in, because mm -hmm. it'd be easier to find them. Mm -hmm. So you guys most times put in different borough, just a different zip code. It's not usually a different borough other than what they're in, or just just a mixture of just a different area where there's nothing affiliated with them already. Is that how it's done? Sure. I mean, it needs to be in a safer, safe area. Um, I'm not sure. I, I so I uh, full disclosure, I've never worked on our hotline, so I don't know like all of the specifics about like that right. particular system. Um, but yeah, it would be in a, um, it would be in an area that um, is identified as safe for that particular survivor. Do you know if the shelter that they in? Because I've I've found out a lot of interesting stuff about different places. Yeah. Um, do they have their own beds? Like, if it's a family person, if it's a whole family, like three kids, mom or dad with the kids or whatever. Because you know, women can be violent against men. Don't have that misconception. It happens. Some women are a little off their rockers too. So you got to be. You know, people don't think that men get abused, but they do. Um. Do you guys have separate rooms for them? How like how paths have separate rooms or do they share spaces? And if it's a single person, do they share spaces? Or you don't know because they are going, they're not really staying with you. They're going out to different shelters. My understanding, and I might I might have this wrong, <laughs> but um, I mean, for our emergency DV shelters, um, I believe it would be the survivor and their, their kids would be in their own space. Um, it, especially, I mean, that's especially I think important for DV survivors who have gone through so much violence and harm already to that they want a, some safety and security. Um, I will say that here, like our domestic violence shelter system um, in in New York State, but specifically in New York City, was really designed with families in mind. Um, and I say that because it can be incredibly difficult as a single adult with no children to find DV shelter placement here in New York City um, because most of the rooms were designed for what's called like a one in one, which means like one adult and one child or, or like a one in two. Um, each year our hotline, like I think the major, like um, the largest percentage of callers calling for DV shelter placement are single adults um, and they're the hardest, um, that's the hardest population to find DV shelter placement. Um, so if there isn't availability for DV shelter, um, our advocates are, of course, going through other options, really safety planning with the person, like maybe they have a friend or family member they can stay with while they're trying to figure things out that that might be safe for them to where they, it might be safe for them to stay temporarily um, or trying to or to wait to see until there is maybe is um, shelter placement. Um, and that's something that we're really advocating for, like at the state level um, to really increase the capacity for our shelter system to take um, single adult uh, DV survivors. But that's that's a big issue um, here in New York City. Oh, wow. That's yeah. interesting. I, I know somebody. We're going to be doing an interview with her soon, guys. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say any names. But um, she went with a different program. And mm -hmm. she didn't go through PATH. Um, 
I want to say she did go. I don't. I don't remember. It's been a while. And she ended up sharing a room with somebody, and she's a DV um person. Mm-hmm. So I was very interested in like how different places do different things. And in New York City, it's not like it's outside of New York or upstate. She did mm-hmm. everything in New York City, and I was surprised that she shared a space. Because I, I, what I knew before she told me that everybody um who are families usually have their own space. But obviously, not everybody is doing that because yeah. she told me she had to share a space with other people. And it was, I was shocked. And I did a poll on YouTube and asked people about that. And they were shocked too. The people, you know, people who did mm-hmm. comment about it. Yeah. But that's interesting that the singles are harder to find spaces for. But yeah. if we get funding for that, I feel like the homeless space, especially in, like, we just have a homeless issue and an overall, you know, problem. Free yeah. homeless. Sing, like it's just you this is everybody we just try to make it <laughs> so yeah we have just, a homelessness crisis we have a housing crisis um and of course like dv shelter is different from general homeless shelter just in terms of the resources available like around counseling and mental health treatment and and trauma supports like dv shelter does have um a different resources available to them than like a homeless shelter so i mean that is why we're really trying to advocate to build out more resources, more options for DV survivors and, and survivors of vi- other violence and abuse as well. Because I think the the dirty secret is there are DV survivors across all of our shelter systems. Um, in our runaway and homeless youth shelter system, which is operated by DYCD, the Department of Youth and Community Development, um, in the DHS system, the Department of Homeless Services sh- system, um, and all, of course, in the HRA domestic violence shelter system, like there, if domestic violence is one of the main drivers of homelessness here in New York City, then of course there are survivors across all of our shelter systems. That's why I, one of my big um, advocacy pushes is like we just want to make all of these resources available, across, like equitable access to housing resources across all of our shelter systems. It doesn't make sense that you might have different options depending on which door you went through currently. Um, whether right. you went through the DYCD door, the DHS door, or the HRA door. It makes no sense to me. That That's like so true. Like, example, um, if you're 18, technically that's a youth, but if you're domestic violence, that's another intersection right there. And plus, if you had a kid on top of it, it's like, mm-hmm. where do people want, but probably will put you in a DV shelter for families. I, I think that'd be the best place to put you, even though you're under the age of 25 or 24, I think it's 24 for um youth in New York City. But it's just like people it's a, just a big problem overall. Yeah. And we just need a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I also want to because I'm throwing so much information, I do want to shout out another organization whose website I always use just to know like the basics on what the shelter like what does the shelter system entail? What does what are the housing resources resources out there? Um there are partner organization New Destiny. So newdestinyhousing.org they have a great resource, like a housing help resource um, website, where it just like goes through all of this information. Like the like for domestic violence emergency shelter, the maximum stay is 180 days. I checked that website just to double check my, because I knew it was 180 days, but I wanted to double check. So I checked the new Destiny Housing website, just because it's just like such a comprehensive website with all of the shelter information, all of the housing resource information, all of these different, um, these it's a really great resource. And back when I did direct service, I would use their website constantly to, to print out information for survivors so that they knew, um, knew all the facts, knew what, like what was available. Yes, definitely. They are very helpful to a lot, many people yep. either who's coming on our podcast and people um, just in general. We yeah. also did an interview with them. They have a lot of resources yeah. for people who are in that situation. Do you, I want to know, like, what benefits do you guys give, or do you only rely on that, the shelter that people are in to give those benefits? Like, example, with how like vouchers, finding mm-hmm. apartments after the or just the shelter just does all that for the people after you kind of do the intake and put them out to other shelters and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. The what? shelter itself. So I mean, it depends. Um, so it depends. I mean, like, I know that that's like such a frustrating answer. Um, but like, <laughs> so for example, like at our family justice centers. Um, staff at the Family Justice Center has had access to certain um, housing vouchers um, that were being able to be processed through the Family Justice Centers. Um, that was um, available. I don't know all of the specifics on like what they're called, um, but they were like one type of voucher. Um, but then of course, um, DV shelters 
they had access to other types of vouchers. So we're processing all of those vouchers through, um, through our uh, by shelter staff. Um, so our, our the housing um, the housing specialists at DV shelters, including ours, but then our uh, our sibling organizations, they also have housing specialists that are doing the same thing, really trying to go over all of the different housing options that might be available and then helping with those applications um, and doing the advocacy piece. Because sometimes our systems are really frustrating and the bureaucracy is maddening. <laughs> so um, it's always helpful to have an advocate who is really trying to push. Um, and that's why I think coalition building is so important because then we can always lean on um, lean on our partners in this work who might have different um, relationships with different people in city government or state government that might be able to help push along like a specific application or address like a systemic issue that we've identified. Um, I like I'm not in the direct service space anymore. I'm on the, the policy and advocacy space, but I'm always leaning on my colleagues um, who are doing this work every day, um, who I really, really rely on um, to know what what's working, what's not working, what do we need to advocate for? Um, and then um, as you've probably seen, I bring those issues into our coalition spaces to be like, is anybody else seeing this? Like, what can we do to like fix this? Um, because I mean, sometimes it's like really, really silly little issues that are causing massive obstacles for our families to find housing. Can you tell us what kind of vouchers that they have out right now? The reason why I ask is because I know a couple of years, years ago when I was in shelter, they had a lot of different vouchers. I know they had the soda, they had um, FAPS, City FAPS. They had um, the link, one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, five, a hundred. <laughs> it, it was ridiculous. Yep. But I know a lot of them, they eliminated and they put them into like City FAPS. So what vouchers might be out there for just regular people, if you know, or, and also for families that they can use or the DV families that they can use to get out of shelter. Yeah, um, so I'm definitely not an expert at this particular question, but <laughs> there are, so this with the, so there is still city FEPs um, and then there's the, the state FEPs vouchers. Um, so those are key resources, especially for our DV survivors in shelter. Um, there are, um, so I think that the city has been processing a lot of the, those emergency housing vouchers, the EHV vouchers that I had mentioned, um, and that was available to different agencies. So um, like uh, our runaway and homeless youth program had like the, the DYCD shelter system had access to a certain number of vouchers, um, EHV vouchers um, for folks through DYCD. Um, and similarly, um, through like the family justice centers and through the shelters, we're able to access some of those EHV vouchers as well. Um, NYCHA is always an option, but, um, and that, that's public housing. NYCHA, um, as far as I know, the wait list is very, 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 very long. Um, so if you do not have a priority status, you might not be able to access NYCHA. Um, the priority statuses include um, for survivors, victims of domestic violence, um, and and there are other um, other priority statuses as well. Um, I mean, if you are so, if you're in a shelter, whether it's a DHS, DHS shelter, a DYCD shelter, an HRA shelter, you should speak to an advocate um, to know what your housing resources are, because based on our our government does things in this way where. Um, it kind of just like depends on what system you're in right now, you might qualify for different things. Um, so you mentioned SODA. Um, that is, I forget what SODA stands for. It's like one time assistance. Like I forget what the S stands yes. for. That's yes, only, that's yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. And that's only available through, um, as far as I know, through DHS. So you have to be like in the yes. DHS shelter system, not like that's not available to you if you're in the HRA DV shelter system, mm -hmm. um, as far as I know. So I mean, like, as you can see, like different resources are available depending on which system you're currently involved in. Um, so that's why I don't wanna confuse folks by just throwing all of this, I, again, I keep just throwing too much information out there, <laughs> but right. um, I would say that's why you wanna speak to uh, um, an advocate who knows what the housing resources are out there. And there are other organizations out there, if, like you don't, um, um, especially if you're not in a shelter right now, like there are different housing um, organizations out there who should be able to walk you through what your options are. And of course, there are certain um, options out there for folks who maybe they maybe they just need assistance paying their rent. They don't want to leave their apartment. They're just they're at risk for eviction. 
there are certain resources that are available um, for um, for you through um, other city uh, resources. Yes, HRA yep. has um, the one shot. They have city fifths of state. They have a lot of different programs. Yeah, that they have out there. Um, yeah, we're doing as he knows, guys. We did a podcast about resources. We have a bigger resource packet coming out soon. That won't be. We might be doing a recording every month. I'm, we're not sure yet, but we will have it on our website. On, on different platforms that we, you know, just follow us so you can get the information. That's all we're doing. We're not doing it just for us because right now I'm out of shelter. I don't really need some of the resources that they are having. I don't mind a little free stuff here, nigga. Things are expensive. But um, the people who really, really need it and really want to get out of their situation and certain things, you don't have to be um, in shelter at the moment to get it. Like the um, one shot deal, you don't have to be in shelter to get that, you know? So just make sure you look up on the resources paperwork that we're going to be giving out to you soon because it can be very helpful and if you're not if you can't use it maybe somebody else can also use it and that can help them in their um in life it's always good to help people you know it's always good to be out there and be a person of light instead of a person of darkness so that's the only good thing about that do you have any last words that you want to tell people about the program that you do and how you are able to help the um families in new york city hmm Final words. Um, I mean, that there's help out there. Um, like, especially when, like, when talking about domestic violence, when talking about sexual violence, gun violence, like all of these forms of violence and abuse um, that again are connected. Um, it might feel like there's that nobody cares um, and that nobody's there to help, um, but there are. There are caring advocates out there um, who. Who want to support you um so you're not alone i mean i think that that is like the the best thing that i could say just in terms of um parting words like you're not alone i can definitely say these things are not a magic wand mm -hmm. there are things out there but you have to be patient with the process people before i went to the shelter people said you're gonna get this apartment you're gonna get this and it made it sound like it was fast it happens right away People sometimes end up staying in shelter for a couple of years. Yeah. I didn't stay, I stayed for like a year and change. Um, people have stayed in more than three years. It's all about you're willing to do stuff. The people who have working for you, if somebody's not working for you, you call through and one or you, you ask a supervisor, what I personally did. I asked the director of the shelter. I said, I want to change my housing specialist because she wasn't doing her job. I saw her help other people, but she wasn't helping me. And I was like, that's, yeah. un that's ridiculous. So, the best thing you can do is advocate for yourself when you get in the system. Stay on their, their necks, their backs to get things done because it's not fun being in the shelter. Like, yeah. it's not a fun place. A lot of shelters are not clean. They have rats, they have roaches. Granted, some apartments in New York City is not clean either. But at least if your apartment is your dirt and <laughs> it's anybody else's dirt with it, you know? Um, just advocate, be patient. Things are not going to happen overnight. Some people who get out yeah. of the shelter three, four months, they're the lucky ones. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. People tell me to get out of the shelter three. I'm like, wow, I'm shocked because the average stay in shelter is a very long time. Yeah. So um, when you're in there, yeah. don't stay down too long. No, don't get stay depressed forever. I'm not saying don't get sad because you need that time to kind of mourn. It's like a grief process. Like you can't. You're almost in shock that you even got to this point. But when you're in there, you know, get help if you need counseling. Get counseling if they have it. If not, they have other counseling resources that will be given out on this web on uh, on this podcast. That can help you. Don't stay to yourself too much. Well, probably stay away from the people, but get help if you need help. Don't just stay there and wallow in it because it's, it's going to make you stay, stay longer. And um, if you're a parent listening to this, just make sure you have the, the best rock for your children because your, your children feed off for you the way you act. You might try to have a smiling face, but they know at night that you're crying. They know at night how you feel because they're feeling they're part of you. You know what I'm saying? So keep your head up. Do what you have to do. And um, if it, people are not helping you there, go somewhere else to get help. Because there's a lot of people out there who are willing to help you. You just have to find the right person to do that. Yeah. So, but yes, guys, thank you again for coming to hear our voices. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jimmy, for your information. Thank you for being in this job so long and helping so many people that I know lives that you have changed. It's, it's not easy being a homeless person in New York City. It's not easy being a homeless person anywhere. But um, being here is just because it's such a big city. I feel like it's a, 
you're in a place full of people, but it feels lonely anyway. So, guys, follow us on all social media. And speak to you next time, guys. Bye.